Heavenly Father, we ask that you would pour your latter rain out upon us, that you would prepare our hearts and minds to hear your voice in this message, that uh, you would overrule my humanity and uh, allow me to be a, a vessel, that the message from the throne room on high would be conveyed to your people at this time. Please bless the work we're doing in this little community and throughout the internet world. And we thank you for the easy times that we still have to come together and worship you and ask a blessing upon our time spent here in Jesus' name. Amen. These things over here are a repeat of what we had up on the board the other day, but they are worth going over a couple times. They are not the, they are not the sermon, so I'm going to move quickly, but I, I want us to start, if at all possible, getting these things in our mind. On December 17th, 2016, the Lord opened up Rafi and Paneum. And the next week we were sharing Rafi and Paneum. I think probably the bottom line of that, the most significant element of that is Paneum. And on the 14th of January, which is what, less than a month later, we presented Paneum in Canada. Okay, this over here is about Paneum. We're in the sermon, we'll deal with that. Most of this was presented in Canada in a more shallow fashion than we're going to try to do it here. But my point is, when the Lord removed his hand from the foundational misunderstanding that the Soviet Union was the King of the South in December 17, 2016, in less than a month, we were teaching Paneum publicly, okay? And we never taught it a lot. But now we're having, we're finding confirmation that this was the Lord's leading, I mean, not that we doubted it, but we could see it prophetically. Now we can see that we were being led by His footsteps from January 14, 2017 to March 27th, 2021 is 1,335 days. Okay, so that's telling us that January 14th of 2017 was a waymark that had been chosen by the Lord long before any of us arrived in history. If you project yourself from January 14th, 1,260 days into this history here, it brings you to June 27th, um, 2020, and 21 days later takes you to July 18th. 252 days later takes you to, 320, to March 27th, 2021. Um, and from here, 273 days takes you to December 25th, 2021. I wanted to review in my mind what I wanted to say about June 27th. It's not popping out. It's in those notes. I'm going to pass over it. At some other time, I'll come back there and remind I'm not, why I'm not putting a great deal of emphasis on that right now. We looked at this line the other day, um, but I want to add, I want to go over it again. From November 9th, 1989 at midnight, the time of the end in this movement, 1,533 weeks later takes you to March 27th, 2019. And we're saying that March 27th is a chiasm for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That's what I'm saying. It's a chiasm that I'm going to put here. I, I, I wanted to have it on the board. I forgot. I'm going to put it on here in just a moment. And it'll be in a more structured fashion. I have it up here, but it's not as symmetrical as it could be. I've got March 27th, 2019, and then right there, March 27th, 2020, and then way over here, March 27th, 2021. I want to put it in a more symmetrical fashion underneath here in a moment. But before I do... From the time of the end in 1989, 1,533 weeks takes you to the beginning of this chiastic structure, which I'm saying is the chiastic structure that is emphasizing the message that goes to Adventism. Okay, and we're saying that because on March 27th, the Adventist Church, this 2020, the center of this chiasm, the Adventist Church, initiates its 100 days of prayer because of this pandemic. Um, but from to emphasize that the Lord was in control of the presentation in K 
Canada on the 14th of January 2017. To give a second witness to it, it's probably a better way to say it. This, this history here takes you 15, 13, 15, my apologies, I have 1335. I'm, I must have been thinking about Daniel 12, okay? It's 1533 days. And this message was about Paneum, okay? And it's bringing us down here to March 27th, 2021, in this history, where Paneum has begun at one level already. Um, but you can see this structure, 273 days after that, 273 being one of the, the symbolic numbers takes us to December 25th. This is the one that really amazes me. Um, this is midnight. These three-way marks make up midnight. September 7th, 2019, 63 days later, nine times seven is 63. 63 days later takes you to November 9th, 2019, which is the 30th year, Ezekiel 1-1. We spent some time on that. 63 days later takes you to January 11th, um, when the message is opened up uh, in this room. 63, wait, 63 weeks later takes you to March 27th, 2021, the end of this chiasm that I'm going to put up here in a moment. But what's amazing about this to me is if you use American dating 9-7 for September 7th, 11-9 for November 9th, and 1-11 for January 11th, and you add 97 to 119, to 111, it equals 327, which is March 22nd, which is this chiastic structure we're going to look at. But if you reverse it and express it in the European fashion, instead of 9-7, it'd be 7-9. Instead of 11-9, it'd be 9-11. And instead of it'd be 1-1-1, only be 11-1. That, and add those together, they don't come to 327, they come to 1101. And if you express 1101 in the European, European dating, it's 11-1, and 11-1 is here. So these dates expressed in the American calendar are emphasizing 327. These dates in the European calendar are emphasizing 111, when the message was opened up. Okay, so now here's the, the chiastic structure that is here, but I just want to make it a little bit more symmetrical. 327, 2019, 327, 2020, and 327, 2021. And it's here that the Adventist Church implements the 100 days of prayer, uh, which takes you to July 4th, um, 2020. July 4th, of course, connects with the story of the United States, Independence Day. 26 days later takes you to July 31st, which is 731. And 731, 731 as a date in the Julian equates to 718 in the Gregorian. Okay, so 731 is a symbol of the message of July 18th. So with this 26 days, in this chiastic structure, we're saying this is of, in Adventism. I did a presentation here on the 26th of March. The presentation was the closed door and I'm going into retirement at this point for five months, okay? There's a hiding for five months. But this 
story here is about Adventism and um, the calling of the Levites and from March 27th, 2029 to March 27th, 2021 is 731 days. What's 731? It's July 18th. It's right over there. Okay. So it's saying that here, the center point of the chiasm is always the punchline of the chiasm. Okay, this, it's the center. The center point is the Seventh-day Adventist Church calls for 100 days of prayer because of the pandemic that has come from Paneum. Okay, so in this 100 days of prayer, you now have two things going on. You have Adventists, the Levites, praying, and their churches are closed down, essentially. So the serious ones are at home taking this crisis seriously, seeking the Lord, and the Lord has providentially put into our history in a situation where Adventism, the Levites, can now start truly trying to seek the influence of the Holy Spirit. And that's the center of this chiasm. Here begins many things with this movement. I step aside, I'm in retirement, the Omega prophecy begins to really take control, do its thing. Um, over here, the conclusion of this in 2021, 731, it's emphasizing that the message that Adventism needs to recognize is 731, is 718, is July 18th. So all these things are coming to the surface right now to confirm for us, I believe, that we're the ones that have been given the sacred trust of this message of July 18th that we are definitely the wise priests that have a message for the Levites and then the Nethanims. And that even though I presented Paneum publicly on January 14th, I very rarely went back to it. We come back to, come back to the school, there was a trimester going on. We discussed, we, we had some classes on Paneum here. But it never became anything that, that, I, that I think any of us, any of the people that were out doing public speaking, went out on a regular basis and opened up Paneum. Um, and I began leading us into the study of Rafi and Paneum some time ago. This is now, I'm, I'm bringing it to a close, but it's going to take some time to do it. And as I said once already here, I think the punchline of this, when the Lord opened up Rafi and Paneum, the real critical point is Paneum, all right, to see. And so much of this was in, I went back in and looked at the notes from Canada. Much of this was in the Canadian notes, not all of it, and I took some stuff out. Um, we're going to try to get through some of these things here today. But when I came over here yesterday and wrote this on the board, I had not yet finished my notes, and so my notes will be in a different order. And here I want to point out something. I'm going to address these three things differently than these other things. All these other things as we get into the notes here are going to be based upon pan. Okay? Um, but what we've been emphasizing here in this study of internal raffia or Daniel's last vision, however you want to look at it, is that in the last six verses of Daniel 11, there are four kingdoms that are the subject of those verses. Uh, the kingdom of the dragon, the kingdom of the beast, the kingdom of the false prophet, and the kingdom of the 144,000. And those four subjects all have their own storyline in, in verses 40 to 45. But with this threefold kingdom of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, the story of the king of the south is, I'm going to say, is essentially verse 40. It's, it's a struggle that goes on with the king of the south in verse 40. But with the king of the north, the papacy, the story is the story of Fatima. Okay, the, the prophecies that were put in place in 1917, time period, to, to the three children in Fatima, Portugal. And I'm, the storyline for the United States is the storyline of the Constitution, and I left out a T. Consti 
substitution of the United States. And we've pointed out that in each of these storylines, whether it's these three kingdoms or this kingdom, that within the stories there is a struggle between conservative and liberals. Okay, um, And that doesn't always fit a pure definition of conservative and liberals, but in the story of the beast, Fatima, you have a good pope, a bad pope, you have a conservative Catholic, a liberal Catholic, you have the white pope and the black pope, which is the Jesuit pope. They're struggling in the story of Fatima, and they're struggling, legitimately struggling in history right now. With the false prophet in the United States, the battle of the Constitution takes place between the liberal Democrats and the conservative Republicans. Okay, uh, With the King of the South, the struggle takes place between Russia, the King of the South, and the United States. Okay, And there is a, a prophetic connection between the United States and the King of the South that allows you to look at that, that takes a little bit of time maybe to internalize, and we've given you an overview of that in a handout last week called The King of the South that you can read. The storyline of the 144,000 is basically three lines, prophet, priest, and king, three things that Christ were, and the 144,000 are to reflect Christ perfectly. And these line up with the, the, the threefold union. The king of the threefold union is the dragon, all right? Um, the false priest is the beast, and the false prophet is the United States. So these three storylines in the story of the 144,000 have their counterparts in these three kingdoms. And when it comes to the story of the prophet, there's at least three places in the kingdom of the 144,000, there's at least three places we need to look. We need to look at the story of Elijah. That's going to play out in the history of verse 40, 45. We have to look at the story of the Omega apostasy that plays out in that history. And also the history of the four generations. Okay, I'm amazed at the four generations. I can't wait till we get to go back into the four generations because we, I, we've taught it correctly. Uh, but I never... I never exercised faith personally because Kathy and I's favorite definition of faith in the spirit of prophecy that Sister White says often is faith is simply taking God at his word. Okay, and you could read about the four generations and you could show from Ezekiel 8 and the other lines that that fourth generation, the apostates that are the fourth generation apostates, that they're going to accept the mark of the beast because in Ezekiel 8 they're bowing down to the sun. So we taught all along that as they apostatize through these four generational tests, the image of jealousy, the secret chambers, the weeping for Tammuz, and they ultimately bow down to the sun, that they become prepared to accept the mark of the beast. And where I lacked simple faith was to understand that in this movement, those people that are preparing for the mark of the beast that are this fourth generation Omega movement, they're actually going to become Catholic, even before they get there. I mean, Catholic. They're actually accepting Catholic doctrine uh, across the board. Okay, Catholic dispensationalism, confessions, uh, praising the Pope, accepting the Jesuit political mindset of liberation theology. They're, they're actually turning in to Catholics, all right? I never saw that. I didn't have the faith to think that would happen. I thought circumstances were going to put them in a position where they would be forced to accept Sunday. I think they're going to just love it when it happens because they're, they're totally coming into Catholicism. The priests, the, the stories in there, I love to see out of that one. I'm not going to look for the blue. Sanctuary. The story of the sanctuary and Jerusalem tells the story of the priests. And the story of the king is the story of the throne of David and the throne of glory, which also would include <coughs> Jerusalem. There's some crossover there. But I think we have to look at all these lines to show these three stories of the 144,000 in Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Now, up here, we have identified um, that Raphia for the priests, okay? 
arrived and passed, we've identified, on November 9th, 2019. And from here to here takes us to Paneum for the priest. The blue is the 144,000. It's the priest. It's you and I. But we're identifying Paneum for this story of the false prophet, the Constitution, was February 5th, 20, 20. That's your 2520 there. And on, I have this further on in the notes. Um, on page 7, if you need to see it. The, the impeachment of Donald Trump began in January of 2017, the, the leading up to the impeachment. But the articles of impeachment were the 10th of December, 2019. I'm saying in the struggle between the liberals and the conservatives in the story of the United States, which is the story of the Constitution, the liberals always win the first battle. The king of the south always wins the first battle in, in Daniel. And then who wins, the, who wins the next battle? King of the north. So the liberals, they won that first battle. They began impeaching Donald Trump as soon as he was inaugurated in January 20th, 2017. And we have, we have the, the public record that makes that claim. But the battle took place, he was defeated here, he lost this battle, and then he won this battle when he was, um, what's the word, I always forget, acquitted on February 5th, 2020. So because this is the victory of the conservative over the liberal here, this would be giving an echo at minimum of paneum. So, at Paneum, we have identified several things that were going to happen. And before we look at the several things, I want to say that here, with the King of the South, Russia, their Rafia is July 18th, 2020. Their Paneum is right here, 2012, December 25th, 2021. Russia loses. This is their Paneum. But here, and I left a P out of here. Okay. But here, the orange is for the papacy, for the beast. Their raffia is right here. Their paneum is right here. And there's a change. There's, there's several little prophetic nuances that we'll have to look at as we focus in on these things one at a time. But in our notes today, if we get to it, we're going to show you here at the Sunday Law. This is the Sunday Law, verse 41. That immediately thereafter, Satan is going to personate Christ. And Satan is going to take control of the Catholic Church. So if this orange is the story of the Catholic Church, of the beast, of the papacy. It wins here. Okay. It, it prevails at the Sunday Law in the United States. It takes control of the threefold union. Do you follow my logic? But who is the papacy? It's the king of the north. How can the king of the north prevail at Raphia? Okay, do you, do you follow me? The king of the south is supposed to win the first battle. Yes? And the king of the north is supposed to win the second battle. But, but we are understanding that the papacy is the king of the north. And I'm saying that here, this is Raphia for the king of the north. And this is Paneum for the king of the north. I, I have to explain that. And the way I explain it is that right here, in fulfillment of the Fatima prophecy, the Catholic Church surrenders its church to who they believe to be Christ. Who's person, it's Satan personating Christ. And who is Satan? He's the dragon. He's the king of the south. Who wants to be the king of the north. So the raffia is here. And then right here, the whole system comes down. When the true king of the north stands up and shakes terribly the earth and human probation closes. So, so there's little nuances as we go through these different battles that we'll have to deal with. But what, what I want to look at now is the first occurrence of Paneum 
And that's in the history of the false prophet of the United States, and it's what we're seeing on planet Earth right now. And I'm suspecting that when we get to the next occurrence of Paneum on July 18th, that some of the things that are causing a crisis not right now are going to be greatly escalated, probably in different ways than we are able to recognize. Because we didn't recognize this was coming either. So I'm on page one of your notes with Paneum. What's, what's Pan mean? All. Everything, okay? So remember that as we go through. And is this, is this the time that you want to be sleeping? Okay. My sister. Okay. Pan relates to the goat god Pan, who is the god of the wild. Paneum, also named Paneus, was later to be renamed Caesarea Philippi, where Jesus said to his disciples, Upon this rock I shall build my church. Commentary on this chapter is found in the Desire of Ages, chapter 45, titled Foreshadowing the Cross. And therefore, foreshadows the midnight cry and the Sunday law. Because those are both the cross. Okay, now if, if you want to see Paneum, if you go to page 6 of your notes, this, the picture on the bottom is a real picture. You can go in Israel and take a tour, probably not now because of the pandemic, but you can take a tour there. This is the the Temple of Pan on the bottom picture. And you see this cave right on the left side? That is the cave where the, the fountain of Pan was. Okay, now this picture on top, this is an, an artist's adaptation of the temples that they thought were there. And he's, he has people in there and the whole nine yards. But when I cut and pasted it from the internet, it looks almost like it's a photograph, but it's not. Okay, so I don't want to mislead you. But that's what they, the, the temple layout that was there in times past, it's no longer there. Now it's just these broken down stones, but that is Caesarea Philippi, Paneum. Okay, and that hole, that, that cave on the left is the fountain of Pan. But go back to page one now. Pan means all, a combining form meaning all occurring originally in loan words from Greek. And then it gives some examples. Uh, like there's some games that they have. I don't know, uh, I guess they're Olympic games or semi-Olympic games. They're called the Pan American Games. And it's just where South America and North America compete with one another. So it's, it's the American games, but they call it Pan-America because Pan means all. And that's what this definition, definition is trying to tell us. Okay, pandemonium. Pandemonium, uh, the reason that it has 1667 there is there was a book written in 167, 1667 called Paradise Lost. I've never read the book. I've heard of the book. Pandemonium in Paradise Lost, the name of the place built in the middle of hell. Palace. Pardon me? Palace. The name of the palace built in the middle of hell, the high capital of Satan and all his peers, and the abode of all the demons, coined by John Milton, that's the author of the book. And then it's going to tell us where John Milton gets this word that he coined in this book about hell. Pan, all, Lat, Latin de, demonium, evil spirit, from the Greek demonium, inferior divine power from dame or lesser god, see demon. And it means wild or noise, noisy disorder or confusion, uproar. We're saying, I'm saying that when we get to Paneum, and I'm saying, I want you to understand, I'm saying the fulfillment of Paneum in verse 40 is, is right here primarily. Okay, this is, this is the Paneum that, that counts, this one here. The one that you can really lay your hands on and say, this is, this is Daniel 11, okay? But I'm saying with these four kingdoms, we see that they're all structured the same. So there's internal, external parallels to each other. And the first occurrence of Paneum was in the United States, 
on February 5th, 2020, 2520. And therefore, when we get to Paneum, this waymark is going to produce these phenomenons that are associated with this word pan. And one of them is panemonium. And the center, you, you probably can't see it up here, but the center, center of pandemonium is in red. I've emphasized demon. This is about all the demons <laughs> oh, cut loose. And you'll notice that it, it says wild and noisy disorder or confusion, uproar uh, in the definition of pandemonium. And I want you to now not worry about Webster, but worry about Ellen White. Review in Herald, August 5th, 1909. She says, Satanic agencies in human form will take part, part in this last great conflict to oppose the building up of the kingdom of God. And heavenly angels and human guys will be on the field of action. The two opposing parties will continue to exist till the closing up of the last great chapter in this world's history. Satanic agencies are in every city. Okay, so... When we reach this point here, uh, we knew there was demons, but now we know on God's word that some of the players that are taking part in the history of planet Earth right now that we believe are human beings are either heavenly angels or they are demons. And this is an agreement with the word pandemonium. You're here now where they're released. Okay? Panic. Definition of panic. Do you see the world in panic? Yeah. What's it in panic over today? Pandemic. The pandemic, the economic collapse, uh, and the economic collapse, if you're not looking closely, it's mainly people are worried about the pandemic causing this economic collapse. But if you want to worry, and there's a place where Sister White says, it's sin to worry, so don't worry. But if you want to worry, you can also add to the panic what's going on in the oil market. The oil market has, gives you just as much concern right now. Saudi and Arabia and what Russia are doing um, with the oil prices causes those people that understand finances to panic. Okay, So we're in a panic. So what does this have to do with anything? It has to do with the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 illustrates the experience of the Adventist people. That's great controversy. I forget the page number right now. Oh. In any case, it's definitely great controversy. And notice this next quote. Character is revealed by a crisis. Dropping down to the bold face. Character is revealed by circumstances. Emergencies bring out the true metal of character. Some sudden and unlooked for calamity, bereavement, or crisis. Some unexpected sickness or anguish. Something that brings the soul face to face with death will bring out the true inwardness of character. It will be made manifest whether there is any real faith in the promises of the Word of God. It will be made manifest whether or not the soul is sustained by grace, whether there is oil in the vessel with the lamp. A, 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 some boyfriend murdered his girlfriend. Did you read about that? Because she was a nurse and he got coronavirus from her. That was one of the stories this week. Did you read that? Okay. He went into a panic and his character manifested itself, okay? That's what this time period is about. It's about manifesting two classes of humanity. And that's what a panic does. Something that brings the soul face to face with death. Evangelism, page 62. The very means that is now so sparingly invested in the cause of God and that is selfishly retained will in a little while be cast with all idols to the moles and to the bats. Money will soon depreciate in value very suddenly when the reality of eternal scenes opens to the senses of man. Is money devaluating very rapidly right now? Notice this next little passage. Um, Tuesday... The 24th of March, so what's that? One that's less than two weeks ago. I think this is from Bloomberg. 
At the close of 2019, there were an unprecedented 11 million American millionaires, a reflection of the longest bull market in history thanks to ultra-low interest rates and tax cuts. Fast forward just a few months and it's a starkly different picture. The number of households in the U.S. above that threshold has dropped by at least 500,000 as of Friday. This economic crash took out 500,000 millionaires. There's 500,000 people that are really bummed out right now and are in a panic about how they lost all that money. Okay, the wealth destruction at the very top has been especially steep. The world's 50 richest, 500 richest people have lost almost $1.3 trillion since the start of the year, according to Bloomberg, Bloomberg Billionaire Index. That's equivalent to 21.6% decline in their collective net worth. Americans on the ranking, who currently number 180, have lost $433 billion. Now, if you're in the money, that's reason to panic, okay? Pandemic. I don't have much to comment on that. We're living that, right? COVID-19, it's here. It, it may have originated long before here on the 5th of February. I'm sure it got started in China before then, but it, it becomes recognized as the pandemic on this side of that way mark. One of these words up here is panacea. And I would argue that if panacea is associated with pan and paneum, then you have to have something like a pandemic. Because what is panacea? It's a solution or remedy for all the difficulties or diseases. Panacea comes from a Greek word meaning all healing. And panacea was the Greek goddess of healing or universal remedy. So if you're not having a pandemic, if you're not having a health problem, then you shouldn't expect to even look for a panacea. Okay? But I'm saying... <clears throat> You have every right to expect panacea here. Among other things, this is one of the Greek gods, okay? And this is all about these Greek gods and these Roman gods, Pan and the Temple of Pan. So, while appearing, this is Great Controversy 589, while appearing to the children of men as a great physician who can heal all their maladies, he will bring disease and disasters until populous cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. So is there going to be disease and disaster that brings its cities to desolation? And who's going to cause it? Satan's going to cause it. And what's he going to do? He's going to bring in a miracle or two to make himself appear to be the great physician. And it talks about... I, 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 okay, I'm going to read on down because there's another point in here that I want to make. Even now he is at work in accidents and calamities by sea and by land in great conflagrations. What's a conflagration? It's like what went on in Australia here recently or what went on in California several months ago. It's a fire, a big, terrible fire. In fierce tornadoes and terrific hailstones and tempest floods, cyclones, tidal waves and earthquakes, in every place and in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. He sweeps away the ripening harvest. What's going on in Africa right now? They have a biblical swarm of locusts in northern Africa. I think it's in northern Africa that has taken out what they need to have because a lot of places in Africa you don't go down to the grocery store you're living off of what you're growing and it's getting wiped out now here's the part I want to add in there he imparts to the air a deadly taint and thousand perish by the pestilence here's what I want to add these visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous my point is is I'm arguing that this is a harbinger of Paneum, this paneum at the level of the United States that we're in right now is a harbinger. It's, it's typifying what's yet to come at the next paneum, but the next PM paneum is going to be even more problematic. It's going to be worse. It only escalates from here on out.
It only gets worse. And because it gets worse, this last sentence, and then the great deceiver will persuade men that those who serve serve God are causing these evils. Okay, the, the purpose of this, the bottom line is that at some point when everyone's totally frustrated about what's going on, then Satan's going to lead them to say, hey, it's these Sabbath keepers in our midst that God is angry at that is causing these problems. Let's get rid of them. Okay, Pandora. So what, what I'm doing is I'm suggesting that Paneum possesses all the characteristics associated with these pans, okay? Pan, it's the temple of Pan that's in Caesarea Philippi, and Pan is the goat god. Um, so they're all connected, pantheism, the, the Pantheon temple, um, and they all come in play when you get into the waymark of Paneum. And I'm saying that this is the waymark that is this message, okay? I'm saying that over here, when the Lord opened up Raphi and Paneum by removing his hand, within one week we were in Holland teaching it, and in less than a month we were teaching Paneum. And then we, we left it off. But Paneum, it projects you all the way over here to this history. The history of 327, 2021, the 1533 does, and the 327 chiasm is telling you that the message for the Levites is... July 18th, 731, because from the 1st July 27th in 2019 to the third one in this chiastic structure, you have 731 days, which is July 18th. The message is July 18th. And July 18th is what I'm saying is the paneum that is Daniel 1140. This is a harbinger of it. It's a warning to the priests that what you understood about this message is correct. And it's going to be rough. But it's only going to get rougher as you go to these following waymarks. And the only way you go through is if you have the faith to believe that the Lord is leading. And these footsteps of God are saying, yes, I am leading. Yes, I told you way back when, when you started looking at eating the little book, that it meant that you had to quit public evangelism and the only message you have was for Adventists. Then he took us a step further and said, no, you're the priest. The message you have is for the Levites that will come out of Adventism. And now he's saying the message for Adventism is July 18th. And it, July 18th is Paneum. And he opened up Paneum when he removed his hand, the same way he removed his hand from the fullness of the year mistake in Millerite history. And he immediately, within a month, had us teaching Paneum. Okay, so I'm saying that this, this message is the message that in all of its ramifications, not just the, the, the name Pan, but this is the message that has to go to Adventism, to the Levites. It's the message that we have to believe if we're going to give it. Okay, Pandora. What's Dora mean? Gifts. So when you say Pandora, what are you saying? All the gifts. Pandora means all the gifts. Here, you got your definition there on page two. In Greek mythology, Pandora, derived from pan, all, or doron, gift, thus the all-endowed, all-gifted, or all-giving. In Greek mythology, she was the first human woman created by Hephaestus on the instruction of Zeus. If that's the case, who's Hephaestus? It would be Adam, perhaps. This is, Pandora is a counterfeit Eve, okay? The first human woman. She's the first human woman that is, gives the gift of life to all mankind. Does not every man's life come through Eve? Okay, so right off the bat, you need, it's worth understanding that Pandora is a counterfeit Eve. And why do you want to understand that? Because the story of Eve conveys a test about a tree and a choice and what you eat. Okay, and that gets carried into this history. Pandora is a symbol of the counterfeit Eve, all the gifts, okay? What's Pandora's box? 
a process that generates many complicated problems as the results of unwise interference in something. The box is not only a gift from Zeus, but also a tool for his revenge. It symbolized a source of trouble, curiosity, and the unknown future. Pandora's action of opening the story means the start of trouble. Now notice this. I looked, I looked, searched this out. There, how many evils are there of Pandora's box? There are seven. And every time I count them, there are eight. So I guess it's the eighth is of the seven. But they'll tell you there's seven evils, and this is what they are, but if you're like me, you count, and it's eight. The seven evils Pandora unleashes from the, the gift box are, and that's gift box, that's got to be a typo, are sickness, death, turmoil, strife, jealousy, hatred, famine, and passion. Curses from Zeus because Prometheus steals fire and gives it to humanity. Okay, so somebody stole some fire, Prometheus, and he gives it to human beings, and these curses come. So what we're saying is when it comes to Pan, that here Pandora's box was opened. Okay, it's gonna get, this is just a harbinger of what really happens here with Paneum, but it's, a, it's actually what you can see going on. Uh, you watch as each day they try to deal with the ramifications of the choices that they're making on trying to control this pandemic and control uh, the finances of Earth. And the problems that they're creating as they move forward are getting more and more unsolvable. And I don't even have to explain that to you. I just have to remind you what Sister White says. They're struggling in vain to put business operations on a more secure basis. It's not going to happen. This is the, the essence of the, the thought of Pandora's box that's opened at Pan, at Panium. So all I'm doing right now is reviewing these words that have Pan in them. The next one is pantheism, a doctrine which identifies God with the universe or regards the universe as a manifestation of God, a worship that admits or tolerates all gods. Why is pantheism significant for Adventists? It's the Alpha apostasy. Therefore, it's speaking to the Omega apostasy. Now, you, you, we've, I've spent... I've always taught the Alpha apostasy from the very beginning in public ministry. So I know I put it in the public record over and over again, and I, I just want to say some brief things about it. John Harvey's Kellogg's pantheistic apostasy, one of the primary things it did is it attacked the foundations of Adventism. Okay, it attacks the foundations. So the Omega apostasy at the end would attack the foundations. Okay, so on page three it says Living Temple. Reference to John Harvey Kellogg's book. This is from Manuscript Releases, Volume 2, page 243. There is in it pantheism, the beginning of theories which, carried to their logical conclusion, would destroy faith in the sanctuary question and in the atonement. I do not think that Dr. Kellogg saw this clearly. I do not think he realized that in laying his new foundation of faith, he was, directly, he was directing his steps towards infidelity. Okay, so it, the next quote is the classic quote about pantheism and John Harvey Kellogg. This one is saying, Sister, Sister White saying, I don't really think he saw where he was going, but that's where he was going. So when I'm saying pantheism, it becomes part of this history. Part of this history is going to be the story of the Omega Movement. Okay, and in this next quote, there's 13 things listed that the Omega Movement would do, and you can show that P&T fulfill every one of them directly. Every one of them. We went through and did this. We've lined out all 13 of them. They fulfilled every one of them directly. And it has to do with attacking the foundations, which they did directly. It was, they're a new movement, as it said they would be. Okay. 
But what I want you to see, which we've spent time on, there is a symbol of the foundations in Adventism. And I'm going to ask a question now to see if ever anyone can guess where I'm going with this. What is the pioneer symbol of the foundations? The charts? So it'd be this chart. If you're going to say pioneer, it'd be a purist and say pre-1844. So <clears throat> what is the symbol of this chart? If this is the foundation in the biggest sense, if you can isolate it down to the smallest sense, the Ten Commandments, the cross, okay, probably all good answers, but I'm, I'm going to point you to Damsteed's book on the foundation of Seventh-day Adventist message and mission. And what he tells us is that William Miller had a foundational approach to his study of prophecy. What was that? I see Daniel shaking his head. It was that uh, paganism, which is the, uh, what's the words there in Daniel 8.13? Like the daily sacrifice and the transgression of yeah. desolation. There, there were two desolating powers. Okay, that it's Dam Street correctly points out that the foundation of William Miller's approach to prophecy is he saw that the prophecies were an illustration of two desolating powers. One outside God's church, paganism, represented in Daniel 8.13 where Daniel was going as the daily sacrifice and then a desolating power within the church which in verse 13 is the transgression of desolation or papalism. William Miller saw all of his prophecy based upon two desolating powers, paganism and papalism. So I'm saying that the, if you were going to shrink down the foundation of this foundation, you shrink it down to the two desolating powers. So if you want to get to the foundation of that, what is it? I'm going to, let's go one step further. What is the foundation of the foundation of the foundation of the Millerite foundation? What did Miller have to understand that, that he recognized in 2 Thessalonians? It's the daily. He says, this paganism is the power that's taken away. If he doesn't know who paganism is, he first has to know who paganism is to be able to identify paganism and papalism. Paganism and papalism are his foundational approach. And if he don't know who paganism is, then he hasn't there yet. The first thing he's got to do is he's got to understand who paganism is. And it's a whole story about William Miller finding the, the discovering paganism in 2 Thessalonians is the daily that's taken away in the book of Daniel. Therefore, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, the foundation of all the foundation is you got to be straight on the daily. And Daniel already stole my thunder. He, he took us to Daniel 8.13. Let's go to Daniel 8.13. Not my thunder. It's God's thunder. It's good thunder. And he didn't steal it. Daniel 8.13 is the foundation and central pillar of Adventism. Sister White says Daniel 8.14 is, but Daniel 8.13 is the question and verse 14 is the answer. They can't be separated, okay? If you separate the question from the answer, then you don't have an answer. Verse 13 says, Then I heard one saint speaking, another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? What is that? That's the introduction of Palmoni. That's recently we've connected that with what? Caesarea Philippi, Matthew 16, 18, and Phi. And what's Caesarea Philippi? It's Paneum. Okay, but what I'm looking at now here is pantheism. And I want to take you to the argument that Miller had to take up and that came into Adventism in the beginning of the 20th century and then we had to take up when this movement came into history. And the argument is over the daily, the foundation of the foundation. And where is that argument fought? 
Do you know where the most significant verse of that argument is? It's in Daniel 8, but it's not verse 13. You know where it is? You know where you fight with, with the theologians? Verse 11. Verse 11 says this. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. And the theologians in Adventism will, will tell you that the prince of the host here is Christ. I don't have a problem with that. Um, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And they'll say because the prince of the host was Christ, that the sanctuary here that was cast down is Christ's heavenly sanctuary. sanctuary. It's a pagan sanctuary. What pagan sanctuary is it? It's the Pantheon temple. Okay, see, so what does the religion of pantheism do? It destroys the foundations. What is the foundation? Daniel 8.11 is part of the foundation. It says, And the place of his sanctuary was cast down. That's the city of Rome was cast down. That's where the Pantheon temple was. You cannot separate these two concepts. Pantheism in Adventism destroys the truth of the daily. It destroys the foundations. Okay, so it is the foundational attack. That's why when Bart Minder came here, he started teaching weird things about the daily and the transgression of desolation. I couldn't figure out what he was doing, but it was. It was part of his work. Yeah. Okay, he, he had to do that. He had to tear down those foundations. So, what I want you to see here, if you, if you can see it, at least at this point in time, this here is about Pan at Paneum that's speaking about an internal argument in Adventism. It's speaking about the Omega movement and the fourth generation. This panic, oh, that could be internal too because there's going to be Adventists that wake up and realize, hey, I'm not where I'm supposed to be and they're going to be in a panic. Sister White says so. The Bible says so. But mainly this is external, I would argue what's going on in planet Earth. This is external, but do you think there's going to be any Adventists that get sick with this? So maybe a little bit of internal. What about pandemonium? Okay, a little of both perhaps. Okay. Panacea? What's the panacea? A healer? That could be internal and external. Okay, so some of them I just want to point out, I think this is more internal pan. Although the New Age movement is part of the story, and that's pantheism. But this pantheon temple, this is the foundation of Adventism, without a doubt. Okay. Running out of time here. Leviticus 16, the scapegoat. What's the name of the scapegoat? You have it in your notes there? Azazel. Azazel. And what is it? It's a female goat. Did you know that? Is, is, I don't know. I, I, what's a female goat? Is there a ewe? Oh, yeah. Well, that's lamb, isn't it? Uh, I, I don't know. This, this is the notes that I pulled from Canada back in 2017. So I, I'm, I'm guessing about female. I know where I'm going with it. I won't argue right now that this goat is female. I think it is. What I'm arguing is that there are two goats. Pardon me? No, goat is called a doe. Okay, but I want to know what Azel is. Azazel. In Leviticus 26, are there not two goats? Yes. And one is the scapegoat. Yes. Okay. So one's going to get sacrificed, one's going to not get sacrificed. And it's speaking about the closing scenes of the Day of Atonement, is it not? The end of the world. So it's talking about a true sacrifice and a counterfeit sacrifice at one level, okay? And what I'm saying is, Pan was what? It was the goat god. It's the counterfeit Christ. Okay, the, in this history. Is this the history of judgment? Yes, this is the closing scenes of the judgment. And it, at these way marks, people are going to be making their choices for eternity and they're going to be choosing between true Christ False Christ. True goat, false goat. 
Panorama. I don't have panorama up here, but it's in your notes. I'm saying panorama is a symbol of judgment. Why am I saying that? Review and Herald, November 4th, 1884. Each one in the day of investigative judgment will stand in character as he really is. He will render an individual account to God. Every word uttered, every departure from integrity, every action that sullies his soul will be weighed in the balance of the sanctuary. Memory will be true and vivid in condemnation of the guilty one who in that day is found wanting. This is, this is judgment, right? Crystal clear. The mind will recall all the thoughts and acts of the past. The whole life will come in review like the scenes in a panorama. Thus everyone will be condemned or acquitted out of his own mouth and the righteousness of God will be vindicated. Next quote is even perhaps more scary. Hereafter, said Jesus, this is Desire of Ages 707. Ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. In these words, Christ presented the reverse of the scene then taking place. He, the Lord of life and glory, would be seated on God's right hand. He would be the judge of all the earth. And from his decision, there could be no appeal. Then every secret thing would be set in the light of God's countenance, and judgment will be passed upon every man according to his deeds. The words of Christ startled the high priest. The thought that there was a resurrection of the dead when all would stand at the bar of God to be rewarded according to their works was a thought of terror, panic, to Caiaphas. He did not wish to believe that in future he would receive sentence according to his work. There rushed before his mind as a panorama the scenes of the final judgment. For a moment he saw the fearful spectacle of the graves giving up their dead with the secrets he had hoped were forever hidden. For a moment he felt as if standing before the eternal judge whose eye, which sees all things, was reading his soul, bringing to light mysteries supposed to be hidden with the dead. The scene passed from the priest's vision. Christ's words cut him, the Sadducee, to the quick. Caiaphas had denied the doctrine of the resurrection, the judgment, and the future life. Now he was maddened by satanic fury. What would you call that? Pandemonium. <laughs> satanic fury is pandemonium. Was this man a prisoner before him? Now to point out, the reason I have that bold face, I want you to see... If you will, and I'm not saying that I fully understand this, he's seen this panorama while he was still alive. Okay, so, so as, as judgment's closing on planet Earth, I got two witnesses here that people are going to see this panorama while they're still alive, understanding their judgment is closed, and pandemonium's going to break out. It's basically, well, anyway, I won't go there to the psychological part. Okay, so from there, I'm, I was, that's the pandemonium. Now I'm going to turn to here. I'm just going to take a few minutes to go over this quickly. Uh, we went over this in the last presentation, but in a casual way, or quick way. And I want to nail it home, and I'll probably begin here next time. You can see Sister White's comment under Education Greek, under Greece. Greece, and then it says education Greek, and she's speaking against Greek education. Okay, this is the con in the context of Nashville, July 18th, and what's symbolized with Madison College in Nashville and Nashville itself. Um, and then you have games, the Olympic Games, okay? Um, and I, I never knew this till here recently, the Olympics are called the Olympics because the Olympics are these, the top Greek gods. That's who the Olympians are. Okay, maybe you all knew that. I didn't. It says, the Olympians are a council of principal ancient Greek and Roman deities consisting of Zeus, Poseidon, Hera, Athena. Athena, who's Athena? Athena is the statue that's in the Parthian, Parthenon temple in Nashville. Okay. She's the goddess of war and of education. Ares, Apollo, Artemis, Didymer, Hephaestus, Aphrodite, Hermes, 
Dionysus or Hestia, also known as the Cronites. The first generation of Olympians are the six children of the Titans, Cronus and Rhea. What I'm wanting you to see here, what, I, what we pointed out last time, is this pandemic that came post Paneum. All the games on planet Earth are shut down and all the schools are shut down. Okay, God is addressing these things. There, who would have thought that all the, the sports and all the games, <laughs> you, I just wouldn't have thought that, that they get shut down. But these are the, the height of Greek um, culture, is education and games. Notice this next quote. Well, read it on your own. Um, I'll, I'll end this. It's Sister White speaking about sports and how objectionable they are from Adventist Home, page 400, and the geography therein. There is one thing that I wanted, inc wanted to include, and I think I cut and pasted it to a next set of notes, but if I can turn to it. Okay, you can, it's on another set of notes. Let me walk through these notes very briefly with you so you can look at them this afternoon on your own time, um, if you choose to. Where we go from here in this study, this is pretty much a review. Um, is I'm saying that these attributes of Paneum are now being acted out on planet Earth, but it's only going to get worse when the second round, the primary application of Paneum hits on July 18th, okay? Um, but I'm saying that some of the things that happen here, because this is the first Sunday law, should also be understood. So on page 9, the glory, that's, that's an argument that the glory is the Constitution of the United States, and where you see Ichabod there, our scripture reading, the glory was removed in the story of Shiloh and the death of, uh, of Eli and Hophni and Phinehas, typifying the Sunday Law, when the glory of the United States is removed when the Constitution is overturned. Okay, and then you have the quote in there that, that any movement in favor of the papacy is actually a movement towards the Sunday law, which we're going to mark a Sunday law here, the first one, but what I'm saying is there are steps that the United States is taking prior to that that are actually qualify as way marks as the Sunday law. An easy one for us to understand is the Patriot Act. That was an attack against the Constitution. If you read Glory, you'll see that the Constitution is the glory of the United States. When the Constitution's gone, the glory is gone. Ichabod. Okay, so as we approach July 18th, there can be actions that are a fulfillment prophetically of Sunday laws, which would qualify then for the Lord to bring judgments from the trumpets of Islam. Okay, threefold union. Uh, you have three quotes on the threefold union. The most important one there for me. The first two will nail it down that the threefold union takes place at the Sunday law, but the third one there on page 10, it says the dragon. Please take note of the second paragraph. It says, and Satan unites with Protestants and Papists. Who's Satan? He's the dragon. Who's the Protestants? False prophet. Who's the Papist? The beast. This is a threefold union, but now it's speaking directly about a role that Satan takes. And he says, and Satan unites with Protestants and Papists papist, acting in consort with them as the god of this world, dictating to men as if they were the subject of his kingdom to be handled and governed and controlled as he pleases. Okay, Satan arrives on the scene of history at the Sunday Law. And the reason that we're putting this in place, this is the Sunday Law, but this is the first Sunday Law. There has to be some kind of manifestation that typifies Satan appearing over here at this way, Mark, and there should be even one inferred here in the history of the priests, okay? That, but, this threefold union is controlled by Satan, okay? And we're, we have to spend some time on that. Then page 11 is about Fatima, about the Catholic preparation to give their church 
to the papacy when he arrives. And notice the fourth quote on page 11 from Great Controversy, page 50, the bold face. The gigantic system of false religion is a masterpiece of Satan's power, a monument of Satan's efforts to seat himself upon the throne to rule the earth according to his will. Satan built the Catholic Church in order to take control of the world. You have to understand that. But in order for the Catholic Church to give itself to Satan, he had to prepare them mentally, and he did so with the prophecies of Fatima. Because they're thinking they're going to give their church to Christ. Okay, Satan's personating Christ. Then the last page, dictatorship. Dictatorship, we know, comes in this history. But what I'm saying is the paneum of February 5th, 2020, that we're already living in, in that history, we already have the elements of a dictatorship. They're already beginning to control whether you can go to this state or that state. They're, they're telling what companies to shut down and telling you what you have to wear when you go outside and how many people can go into that store and how many can't go into that store. And I'm saying I get the logic of it. I'm not threatened by it that they're dealing with a worldwide health crisis. But if you step away from it, that is typifying what you understand about a dictatorship. All right, its despotism is here in advance of when it really arrives on July 18th to give us forewarning, to give us confidence that we do have an understanding, a correct understanding of this message. And then the last one is the quote where it says that the people, let me read it. And then the great deceiver will persuade men that those who serve God are causing these evils. The, the class that have provoked the displeasure of heaven will charge all their troubles upon those whose obedience to God's commandment is a perpetual reproof to transgressors. It will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath, that this sin has brought the calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance shall be strictly enforced. So this is about Sunday observance ending the calamities. And those who present the claims of the fourth commandments, hopefully that's you and I. Thus destroying reverence for Sunday are troublers of the people, preventing their restoration to divine favor and temporal prosperity. Something has to happen to the temporal prosperity in the United States for this to be fulfilled. Are you looking around? It's happening. There, I, I, I heard a couple weeks ago, well, unemployment may go to 20%. No, it's going to go to 30%. It's going to go to 42%. Okay, at the trend it's going, even if it stopped at 42%, if 42% of the workforce is taken out in the next month, that isn't a recession, that's a depression. Amen. And, and it, it's Pandora's box. You don't just crawl out of that by throwing money at it. Okay? All the people that are in these, whatever you call these industries, like hotels and restaurants, they're not, they're not coming back to work immediately. And the people that typically go to hotels and restaurants aren't going to go out eating and go to hotels immediately either when this is over. It will take a long time to revive that industry. Same with the airline industry. It's, it's, Pandora's box has been opened. And the return to temporal prosperity that we were warned would be the cry of those people is being fulfilled before our very eyes. Shall we pr pray? Pardon. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you have given us the prophetic word that we might recognize the times in which we're living and the things that are coming on planet Earth. But I am also thankful and amazed, overwhelmed, that you are confirming through the chronology and these footsteps that are encoded in the, the dates and the numbers. You're confirming that we are the people that you have chosen to give this message and that this is the message it needs to be given. Not only did you give us the message, but you gave us the ability to see that you have called us, if we will but see. We thank you for that. We ask a blessing upon the rest of this Sabbath day. 
blessing upon this message wherever it might go. In Jesus' name, amen.